Good evening to everyone joining us on the inaugural IoT Hotspot Conference. I am Tom White. I'm the host of the IoT podcast and joined with Rob Van Kranenberg, the founder of the IoT Council and IoT Day. We're going to talk a little bit just to set the scene about how we came up with the idea of the IoT Hotspot Conference and um, talk a little bit about some of the guests that we have on today and kindly given up their time also to talk about the wonderful world of IoT. Um, Rob, maybe we, we can kick off with you just to talk a little bit about your initiative with IoT Day, which has really spurred on this global uh, presence of joining people from all four parts of the world. Yes, um, yes, absolutely. So um, I think sort of for most people, this Internet of Things is, is, is seems to be quite recent in a way. And, um, and, and it's a very strange beast because every year sort of we read in a newspaper, this is going to be the year of Internet of Things. This is going to be the year of Internet of Things. Uh, uh, this is going to be the year of Internet of Things. And we, we've been reading that from 2002 to 2000 to now basically and it's such a strange thing because it's 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 this kind of this kind of um um it's kind of both a vision and an activity of connecting basically everything on the planet now that's such a strange idea if you think of it that um uh it almost seems to be like like a kind of um uh, a rising tide so it, it's 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 you get this this um you think back about this this story about the frog being boiled in 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 hot water it's just everybody sees it and knows it it's just the frog who doesn't sort of knows that that things are going on and this is a little bit also how i felt um um when i stumbled on this internet of things um when it was still called ambient intelligence around 2000 and I realized it was actually quite a long trajectory of, of automation. And um, and actually, a lot of the things that, that were then happening were, um, were also sort of um, happening with, with the same people. With, it was happening a lot with computer scientists, was happening a lot with engineers, was happening a lot with people who were... Um, uh, busy with with uh, efficiency and on optimizing uh, processes and, and things um, but all along sort of this this um, this uh, wave this kind of rising tide it spilled over into society sort of uh, it it, um, it got out of the, the the processes in which it was in and it moved into the real world it moved into our everyday lives it and, and that's where it's now basically um, and so I thought we 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 really need to, um, to discuss what's happening with, with with a lot of people and more people and a different variety of stakeholders, and um, that was a reason for 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 for, for setting up and kicking off um, IoT Day. And, and Rob, thank you for that. I mean, it uh, it was a fantastic initiative that you took, also alongside the IoT Council. I think there are coming on to six hundred members of the IoT Council now, maybe more than that. Um, I don't know what the up-to-date figures are, Rob. I think it's um, it, it, it's it's fluctuating, and there's there's people coming and going, and but basically it's it's alive on a very old-school mailing list. For a lot of people, it's been really adding value to um, to to what to, to their activities, and um, and and that's really the idea of having this kind of free, open exchange of 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 information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and I think that's one of the reasons why we're so keen to to collaborate and and to to start this inaugural hotspot conference. So, um, a little bit about myself. So, so I'm the the founder and the host of the IoT podcast. Um, also involved in the consulting and staffing arena for the IoT industry with the company above me, um, and we joined the council. I think it was 2018 and we, we started having many conversations, Rob, about how can we increase the voice of IoT for people that perhaps are outside of the industry. So, you know, IoT is, is a relatively new term, but the technology is is is, uh, is something that's been around for a long time, right? We used to call it M2M, 
you know, before that it, it was just networking and so on, right? So I think where where we're going is to create content to raise the voice of people, thought leaders in the space, and to talk about some of the fantastic uh, initiatives that can come from from IoT projects. You know, my background is that I uh, spent a lot of time in the pay TV industry working with operators and broadcasters, and a phrase that I, I say a lot, and for anyone that's followed the podcast, is uh, it's just entertainment at the end of the day, right? It's just media, it's just TV. Whereas I think some of the projects that are happening in IoT are truly life changing. You know, people talk about the fourth industrial revolution and people talk about bleeding edge tech and, and it's often overused. But I think it's fair to say we're both very passionate about the use cases that are currently out there. And the idea behind this show, you know, is 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 to is to produce content and and to enable people that don't really understand the term to know what it means and why they should be concerned. And, and hopefully initiatives like this together can really raise the profile because I think we can both agree, Rob, can't we, that you know, the, more, the more we talk about it, the more content that we, that we give, the better for everyone involved in the industry. Absolutely. I think um, it's also, this is, a, this is a kind of, a, again, it's a very strange moment because it concerns everything. And so, I mean, when you say that normally, people would say you're, I mean, it's a, it's a crazy thing to say, sort of. But um, but but we are in a situation where it does concern everything. It means, and that means that the pie is is, is extraordinarily big. <laughs> sort of it 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 and the the beauty of the of the operation is that that if done well, it it will it creates a kind of abundance of data and insights that can lead to new services and that can lead to basically new ways of 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 um of operating um and there's almost a limitless amount of use cases uh in iot but something that's really come to the forefront from the pandemic and and how we get out of this and what we can do moving forward and i hope this is something that we can touch upon today um with, with everyone that's kindly given up their time to, to come and talk and to describe what they're doing within iot from a, either a personal or a business perspective and for those that are just joining the uh the conference a, a little a little bit later um you know there's there's some fantastic people here today and we're, we're thrilled um to 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 be starting this inaugural hotspot conference in collaboration with the iot day and the iot council <laughs> As a, an engineer, I, I develop software for IoT applications since quite some years. And uh, besides, I also work a lot as a maker in the Fab Lab, in the local Fab Lab, to build stuff in yeah, the easiest possible way with digital tools. And in this project, I try to combine both of it. The project itself is about media ecological infrastructures for biodiversity. It's a very interdisciplinary research project, um, also funded by the Swiss National Fund. So it's a yeah, relatively big project together with other universities. And it's interdisciplinary in the sense that we work with biologists, ecologists, designers, and we are from the computer science section, so to say. That means we have to provide a sort of an IoT infrastructure that is put in uh, zones that are urban and also have a lot of nature. So it's like a, a mixed zone. Usually it's parks. And we have three locations, and the first of it is a nice uh, botanical garden with also other types of nature. So there's a lot of plants and animals and also people mixing in the same zone. And our deployments look a bit like this. This is for a first experiment. We are doing placing pots with one type of plant in different locations. 
and observing them with cameras to see which pollinators are visiting the plants. So this is the requirement for us as a technical team. We need networked cameras in different locations, sometimes a bit far off the next building, because it's cameras we need also enough, enough uh, bandwidth to access them. So if you need, let's say, uh, 4G connectivity outdoors, there are quite some products. Uh, unfortunately, these ruggedized versions of products are usually uh, rather expensive. There we started thinking if there's an alternative to provide internet connectivity to uh, cameras, network cameras, in a maybe more uh, cost-effective way. And maybe you know this uh, Chaos Computer Club in Germany. They organize a nice summer camp every four years uh, that gathers about 3,000 people. And there I saw this solution for connectivity that uses indoor equipment in a watertight housing. They use uh, these toilet houses as a server rack and provide connectivity uh, yeah, to outdoors users. So this would be more or less the gold standard of outdoor connectivity. Um, we don't have hundreds of users, but just a few cameras around one location. So the idea was to use something similar in a smaller packaging. Uh, the advantage of using off the shelf cheap components is of course price. Uh, this standard 4G router is way less expensive than the rocketized version. We also decided to use power over Ethernet to provide power to the cameras uh, together with the network. The idea is to combine these uh, commodity building materials with cheap indoor hardware and make a ruggedized version of uh, an access point as shown here. This was the initial drawing of the idea. And you have some distances, so the power line can be about 100 meters. That's where you get to place the access point relative to power sources. Then you have power over Ethernet connections to the cameras. Around 30 meters max is what we found to be still working. Uh, you also get Wi-Fi, maybe a little bit more than 30 meters. Um, these access points are not super optimized for long distance. And you get a 3 or 4G uplink. So the access point has a SIM card and provides uh, connectivity. The whole setup is still a bit uh, cheaper than using a rocketized hotspot and maybe Wi-Fi based cameras because with power over Ethernet you get uh, yeah, power at the same time and otherwise you would still have to distribute the power. Then we get real. So the experiment is to place these pots with uh, a type of plant in different locations in the park and watch it with the cameras to see which pollinators come visit it. Later on, this all should uh, work with machine learning and de automatic detection. But of course, first we needed the camera. Here this stand turned out to also be a nice table for doing work in the field. And this would be the setup. The camera sees the plant from the top. This is the perspective of the camera. Here you see that yeah, it's important to have the right section of the pot filmed. Then it should be as focused as possible. There we are still learning how to do it. These Raspberry Pi cams require manual focusing. Then you need yeah, to have the power from far away. 
And yeah, here you see a bit the, the first situation. It's a pasture. The sheep are also living there in this, in this meadow. Then we had dry grasslands in another setup where it's a bit steeper. So these cameras and pots were spread all around the park. Was about it. I realized that this is very uh, standard technology. And here the main challenge was to apply it to a new setting and provide a technology that works together with people and can survive in a park, so to say. Absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. It's Thank a, you, Rob. A fascinating, um, I would say, like, sort of, it's, it's an amazing amount of skills sort of coming together in, in, in this, uh, not only on the interdisciplinary research aspect, but also on the practical aspects of, of, of putting it. I would like to talk about something that is super exciting to me. And when I joined Balena and I and I read about this and I started to think real, uh, so it, it gets super excited on, on me. And it's Balena Hub, what you see on, on the slides. So in case maybe some of you don't know Balena, um, but maybe uh, you know or you use Balena Etcher. I don't know if anyone used uh, Balena Etcher in the room. Feel free to raise your hands or to say hello on the chat. Um, so yeah, virtually raising hands, it's very complicated. So if you use Etcher, um, well, by the way, Etcher is one of the most used, um, software, open source software to flash SD cards or USB drive with usually OS, um, operating, uh, systems. So if you use Etcher, you already use Balena software and you understand how we do software or how we like to do things. We like to reduce the friction on every project or everything to just help people, companies, developers to, to reach their goal and to try to simplify the IoT. Um, at Belena, we also build a minimal operating system for devices. We also make a container um, runtime for, for Belena OS. Actually, Belena OS, which is an open source operating system, only runs containers. Okay, and we also made an IoT fleet management tool called uh, Belena Cloud and the open version of uh, Belena Cloud that it's called Open Belena. But today, yeah, I'm not going to talk about this. Okay, um, actually, I'm going to talk about one of my passions. Passions. Um, I love making applications. I like programming. I'm not very good at it, but <laughs> I really like to make applications that people use. And um, I have been working on IoT for the last 15 years. Um, it's great to see what, that when you make something and more on IoT and it's being used and it's being shared and even you're, you're being remembered, that's, that's super great. And, and the, the thing that you get, it's, um, it's, really, it's really nice. So this is why I think that programming is magic. But on the other hand, uh, yeah, pr and probably you know, if you're here, IoT is still very hard. It's 2021. I remember speaking with uh, Rob maybe like uh, not 10 years ago, but maybe eight years ago, you know, speaking like uh, IoT, it's very challenging. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the reality is that at Balena, we are helping a lot of companies um, and successful businesses to reduce the friction of IoT and trying to make the IoT less hard. Um, but we know, um, and yeah, this is something yeah, that everyone is feeling, that IoT and edge applications today are still hard to build, to deploy, to use, to distribute, and to maintain. And I have myself dozens of experience, of bad experience on, on these. And, and actually, we have an hypothesis at Belena. We think that people working on IoT, it's super smart, it's super good, but the complexity inhibits all of this innovation that, that all the people working on IoT have. And, and then that repercutes that the IoT and edge applications or, or systems are still not good enough. Um, so we need people that gets more innovative on IoT and Edge. And, and this is why 
why we are here, what, why we can ask, uh, why we can help you here. But let me give you an example, okay, of what I what I say about um, yeah that that um, yeah that that maybe we are still not enough successful on on IoT because the complexity is innovating the the innovation. Um, Let's let's see Raspberry Pi. So actually, last year Raspberry Pi reported that they sold, uh, I think, in the whole history, more than thirty million of Raspberry Pis. Actually, we love Raspberry Pi, and we use Raspberry Pi a lot on on Belena. But what is the experience when you buy a Raspberry Pi? Um, if you want to buy a Raspberry Pi, you get this amazing kit at home, and and then, and then what? What do you do with this kit? Okay, so yeah, I, I usually do this. I go to Google, I Google Raspberry Pi projects, maybe, or, uh, but yeah, as you can see, this clearly doesn't help a lot. That, is a, that doesn't give me the way to, yeah, to get um, to master on, on Raspberry Pi projects immediately. And to be honest, as a user, I expect a place where I can find nice projects to start playing immediately once I get the Raspberry Pi. And as a developer, um, I expect a place where I can uh, exposure or yeah or get exposure from my developments. Okay, so if you're a developer and you spend several weeks coding an amazing IoT edge application, probably you dream to enable or to facilitate uh, other people to use your applications. And or even yeah, get paid you know, for people using your applications. And this is not possible today. This is sad, but it's not possible. Release IoT Edge applications and deploy them easily in a lot of uh, IoT Edge devices. It's hard. So we saw Thomas before on the on the previous presentation when they were trying to scale. No, I could imagine that they were they had to flash a lot of SD cards, etc. Or even when we ask him, hey. Do you have a machine uh, a machine learning model on the Raspberry Pi running? Yeah, oh, wow, it's hard. Maybe we know how can we deploy new services on the top of this Raspberry Pi? So at Belena, we want to solve this problem. And actually, we, we are solving this problem for our customers. So we want to solve it for everyone, for all the developers in the community. And, and yeah, and let me let me show you how we do it. We do it. Um, with Belena Hub. Belena Hub is a catalog of IoT Edge applications that deliver applications into devices in a really simple way. Now developers are going to be able to reach IoT devices and users with Belena Hub. And, and something that is very interesting, I mentioned before about Belena Etcher. So Belena Etcher, it's, this software is being used millions of times every month. So what we want to do is to give exposure to developers um, Oh, well, the applications that they submit on Belena Hub, we want to give exposures of that into Belena Etcher. And that means that we, we think that we can inspire millions of people on using applications, but as well on introducing innovation on the IoT. Um, with Belena Hub, you will be able to distribute applications, create fleets that I'm going to tell you what, what is a fleet in a second. And it will work on, on devices such as Raspberry Pis, NVIDIA Jetsons, BeagleBones, and more. So to, just to let you know, um, Belena OS is compatible with more than 70 different devices, from Intel devices to ARM devices. So that means that if, if you write the code for one application, you can make almost automatically these uh, uh, application compatible with 70 different devices in the world. So that's that's really cool for a developer. So let's take a look inside the Belena Hub today. Uh, so today, uh, well, maybe it's a bit small, but on the left menu, you can go to hub.belena.io as well and check it yourself. Meanwhile, I'm speaking. But on the left menu, you have three options. Actually, you have fleets, you have projects, and you have blocks. And in the center, you can see all the applications for that category. OK. Um, by the way, just to mention something else, all the applications that are on Belena Hub are open source, and th these are non-commercial projects. Okay, this should be non-commercial projects to be on Belena Hub. Um, so let's, um, yeah, let's let's uh, let me tell you what is an open fleet before I get into into this. But um, an open fleet 
it's an IoT project or for, a, for IoT on edge devices where users can join their device without creating a Belena Cloud account. Um, so usually our customers, um, yeah, they have a fleet of devices. Uh, so they have a lot of devices spread all around the world, and this is a fleet for, for us. So when we say uh, an open fleet on Belena Hub, that means that, yeah, I, I as an app developer or as an app owner, I introduce an application and everyone who joins that application joins my fleet. So I can manage and maintain that fleet. If there is a bug on my GitHub repository and I do a pull request to, to solve that bug, and then I, do, uh, I push this code uh, or I push a new release of this code, all the devices that belong to my application they get the new release um, and it's deployed automatically to them. Um, so yeah, let's imagine, yeah, let me give you an example of this. So let's imagine that I have, or you have some old speakers at home, some old hi-fi uh, equipment at home that, yeah, that it doesn't work anymore with your Bluetooth or with your Spotify. So, and you want to convert that as a Bluetooth speaker. So we have an app for that. It's called Balena Sound, and let me show you, um, yeah, how Balena Sound works or it can help you. Actually, currently, yesterday, yes, I took this uh, screenshot yesterday. Yesterday, there were 191 people all around the world who joined the fleet of Balena Sound to digitalize their old speakers or old hi-fi equipment um, and, and control it over Bluetooth with their mobile phones and run Spotify or whatever. Okay, so um, yeah, there's a fleet. So the, the fleet, when you click get started, actually what happens, and I think I have a screenshot for that, is that you, we tell you, we ask you, okay, what device you have? You have a Pi Zero, you have a Pi Three, Pi Four, uh, you have an NVIDIA Jetson, an Intel NAC, then you introduce your, your Wi-Fi credentials and what you get, it's an operating system image from Belena with your Wi-Fi credentials and when you flash that uh, operating system image in an SD card, like yeah, like this, yeah, like this, you introduce it on your Raspberry Pi, in this case, a uh, Pi Zero, for example, and automatically you have Balena, you join um, with your Wi Fi credentials that you already introduced here, you join the Balena Sound open fleet, and you can start enjoying Balena Sound on your device. In case that there is a back or there is a new feature that's included on the project the um, the app owner in this case it's the balena team the balena hardware hackers team um will deploy the new the new release and your device will get the latest release of the balena sound um. Uh, well, I'm uh, glad so, to uh, to be here and uh, talk about a little bit about the IT day in uh, Rotterdam and my experiences uh, with that. Uh, Ten years of promoting IT thinking in uh, research, education, and practice, uh, and I will uh, yeah tell something about my experience uh, in uh, in yeah getting IT thinking uh, around in our, our region. Uh, Ten years ago, as a lecturer and researcher at the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences, I took the initiative to help organize the International IT Day uh, edition in Rotterdam uh, because I thought it would be a good idea to introduce my colleagues and our students from our digital technology courses to the development of IoT uh, and to seek cooperation with local governments and businesses. Uh, over the years, uh, and with uh, great support of uh, uh, our research center at the University of uh, Rotterdam, IT Day Rotterdam grew into an event with hundreds of participants. I think uh, the, the last two or three years, we have about 300 participants uh, participating in our event that uh, is an event of one or two days. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, the, the audience is, uh, is, has been growing over the years. Um, and uh, now, after 10 years of organizing IT Day Rotterdam, I see uh, technological developments such as uh, IoT, but also uh, AI and uh, Smart City 
getting lots of attention in our uh, region. I will tell something about uh, yeah, my experiences and uh, my collaboration between our university and the local governments and businesses and society. Uh, I will speak about uh, theory uh, versus innovation, about research versus practice, about the benefit of doing things rather than talking, and the challenge of interdisciplinary systems thinking and design. Um, yeah, well, with regard to uh, research or practice, um, I think that this mutual learning between the universities and the governments and businesses is needed for another reason. As a University of Applied Sciences, we train our students not to become researchers, but to become practitioners. However, to prepare future professionals for contributing to innovation and practice in the future, both universities of applied sciences, as well as businesses, have to learn about these emerging technologies. And they can learn about these technologies at the same time. Doing the correlation in the way we do it uh, is a way uh, we can both innovate our curriculum and both help businesses with innovation their practice. But especially, uh, also, especially when dealing with uh, the engineering and the design of infrastructures that pervade everyone's li lives and living environments, we need to engage civic society um, to bring in the people's perspectives in our challenges. Uh, and that's what we have done in the, in the last years. We, we, we shifted from this triple helix paradigm uh, to a quadruple helix paradigm where we really try to involve civic society and civic organizations and citizens in our city. What I'd like to, to mention especially is that uh, it, we discovered that it was very uh, useful to uh, stop talking and start doing. In our Internet Things Day, we, uh, uh, we always have a hackathon and um, this hackathon was an important activity for us to bring different stakeholders of the Quadruple Helix to the table. Not only to present their ideas or to discuss uh, their ideas, but especially to make prototypes. Then um, I'd like to conclude with uh, thinking about uh, its disciplinary systems thinking uh, and design, uh, also at our university. I think uh, that now, after 10 years, it has become clear to us what our challenges nowadays are at the uh, University of Applied Sciences. Um, first of all, uh, that our separate courses, such as uh, digital design or computer science or architecture or civil engineering, fall short in their own discipline to tackle the larger societal challenges we are facing, such as climate change, or energy transition, or poverty, or creating livable and resilient cities and communities. And especially with regard to uh, current AI developments, for example, uh, it's, it's becoming important how to safeguard the humane aspects in decision making. It is shift from artificial intelligence to collective intelligence. More than ever before, our universities need to rethink their programs in order to deliver professionals to the market that know how to collaborate with other disciplines. And in our hard to connected world, it is becoming crucial to understand the network independencies of systems in all domains of society. And not society alone, also the planet is at stake. So where the quadruple helix collaborations are useful for societal challenges, it is insufficient for dealing with challenges in our natural environment. And to bring in the voice of nature, of our flora and fauna, and for improving our climate and biodiversity, we should act from out a quintuple, quintuple helix paradigm. We as people both need technology and nature. So, to conclude my talk for now, and I'd like to discuss the topics I, uh, I, I presented to you. Uh, I see two cha challenges I had for myself as um, a co co coordinator of a smart and social city theme at the university and as a researcher and lecturer, but also for the IoT community as a whole. 
And I think uh, we uh, see uh, two challenges. The first one is uh, how we can shift towards a yeah, collective intelligence as a result of responsible innovation that is safeguarding public and democratic values in the design of technological systems. And second, how to shift from this quadruple helix paradigm towards a quintuple paradigm in order to account for our natural environment. And I hope that 10 years from now, we have succeeded in finding the methods and technologies to tackle those two challenges. And I wish, uh, I wish a Godspeed uh, to you all on that journey. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. My talk today is mainly about the focus of my research. And uh, I call it, since the last two months, I'm calling it reuse.city. Smart in smart cities is often about control. Uh, it has this idea of increasing the efficiency of cities, whatever that is, and there is a lot of very interesting critical discussion about that in recent literature. I think one of the, 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 the easiest to follow is a pamphlet uh, written by Adam Greenfield called Against the Smart City. And I remember he talks uh, very precisely about efficiency being very hard to measure in cities. So what is efficiency when you have issues of power and, uh, and policies that are not implemented or not even created? How do you measure efficiency? Smart cities are, are also usually uh, a very, they adopt a very top-down approach. They ignore the legacy of urbanism. There is, there, there are hundreds of, of interesting references talking about the right to the city that are not taken into account when people discuss smart cities. They are uh, arguably of little benefit to people. So when you talk about increasing, increasing the efficiency from the standpoint of the public administration, it's often about reducing costs. And uh, it is very rare that you see smart city initiatives discussing with the population. Sometimes they, they kind of fake discussions, uh, as you can see, for instance, in the Sidewalk Labs project in, in Canada, and uh, there was this attempt at using citizen participation to, to legitimize the project. But in the end, I think Google and Sidewalk decided to give up on the project because they were not actually listening to people. They were not trying to uh, increase or to improve the citizens' lives, but they were just trying to push technology and to make that a kind of, you know, uh, a, a, a way to show their technologies. And there is no challenge to the status quo in most of the smart city projects. So I come from this critical perspective on what smart cities usually are, or the mainstream narrative of, of smart cities, is, or smart cities uh, usually brings. And I'm trying to bring that into my research. So um, there is, in, as I mentioned, there is vet, very little opportunity for the cities and the citizens. And it's, I, I'm trying to, to change uh, this, this term. I'm not, I'm not that uh, comfortable using citizen any, anymore, being a foreign citizen in an European country. But the people, the city dwellers, uh, they are not asked whether they want to refuse the top-down smart city projects. And in my project, as proposed by the Open Dot project, I will try to seek kin kinder and fairer and citizen-centered cities. So you usually see smart city initiatives focusing on traffic control or lighting or surveillance. Sometimes it's about access to uh, city dwellers. Sometimes it's about energy management and sensors and environment and quality of air and quality of water. And there are projects about inventory of public, uh, public goods. But uh, there is one particular topic 
that I found that I could contribute a lot to. And the topic is waste management. But again, when it comes to smart city literature and industry references, whatever you see about uh, smart cities that relates to waste management is always, again, focused on the needs and, uh, and the, the problems faced, issues, uh, the issues faced by companies and governments. You see a lot of projects talking about smart beings and increasing the efficiency of household uh, waste collection. There is this, this uh, kind of bias towards making waste disappear as quickly as possible. And I, I think there's some kind of psychological element uh, to that. And uh, there is very little citizen agency when you talk about waste and smart cities. And the end goal seems to be always about increasing the amount of waste that is recycled. Reuse city. So this is this started in April this year as an online co-design lab with participants from 10 different countries. And I had the opportunity to organize a series of online workshops in which we would discuss reuse and uh, smart cities. And how does that uh, connect to, uh, com uh, to community practices of repair, of upcycling and recirculation of uh, materials? And we ended up having very interesting discussions about uh, reuse centers and different kinds of technology that could help on that. And I ended up focusing on three uh, prototypes. I have conducted this co-design lab with participants from different parts of the world, and we decided to focus on three different uh, concept ideas that came from earlier phases of research, but then they were also informed by these discussions with participants. The first of them uh, I was calling the universal registry of things. So it is uh, uh, this concept of a distributed database that would have information about how to reuse different kinds of objects and materials and would make this information available for different users. So it would be a way to check on if I find, for instance, I don't know, a bike, uh, uh, or someone gives me a bike and I can uh, quickly find information about the parts and what I can do with that and what is its value on the second-hand market and other kinds of information like that and stories of users uh, and that can apply to a bike or to a computer or a mobile phone or any kind of object virtually. Then the second prototype, uh, I'm calling it EI, the evaluation interface, that would be ways to connect to that database, to the universal database or to the universal register of things. So we can think in terms of, oh, sorry, there are workshops here, so you might be hearing uh, noise in the background. Uh, so it could be either a smartphone app that I could point to an object and then find information about uh, how to reuse that object, or it could be a workbench machine, a workbench workbench machine that I could bring objects to it and then the machine would recognize and give me information about you know, spare parts and tools and stories of other users. And finally, the third, the third concept idea that I was working with uh, participants on was the idea of transformation labs that is somehow related to makerspaces and also to reuse centers but it, ha it would have this focus not on making new stuff and not only on recirculating uh, secondhand goods, but also on allowing people from cities and communities to go to these places and bring objects to be either repaired or transformed into other things or transformed in any way. And then this is the state of my research. I'm trying to turn these three ideas of the database the technologies to access the database and the places in the cities uh, and trying to transform all of them into sort of fictional or speculative prototypes and to discuss how technology can be implemented uh, both in these spaces as well as in these technologies. So we introduced this panel like 
the financial models which apply it in different IoT applications and uh, especially about uh, the ethical dimensions, how it could be applied. We already know a lot of the cases which bring us to the very scary world about how we different things which connected around us could collect a lot of information. And when we start to speak about the data collections, we already start to think about the person and what kind of very personal data could be collected. In most of the contemporary systems, they belong to so-called ecosystems. And for example, when we are talking about the Apple, we understand what they very straight to control your own ecosystem and all devices which belongs to that. Here we understand what the privacy and the data collections and the financial models about that, they definitely have ethical dimension. When we go to the one ecosystem, usually we cannot go out from that. This so-called the network effects, which um, from the design point of view included in the different uh, platforming strategies. And when you try to go in, you definitely invest a lot of the money to belong to one system. And usually you can switch from one to now one. When you would like to do that, you will lost a lot of you, let's say, capital, financial or data capital, whatever. And it, this is very important when we are talking about the IOT architecture. We should understand what uh, different systems which are uh, united in one big platform, they can definitely control you and the remote control is the second dimension which is very important for us. This remote control uh, significantly influence of, on our data and how our system operated. And since we are talking about the ethical dimension of that, we should understand what science we have more and more data around us. We can go deeply and deeply about so-called so our medical, psychological, uh, and uh, soon I think we will go on more deep level, which call it in and big converse, converse, against technologies which will allow us to understand uh, the control about the human body even on DNA level. It's a lot of the experiments which uh, highlight for us, for example, what if we can correct uh, one or another DNA cells, we could be more happy or something like that. And uh, this is exactly the point when we go to the financial models and how we structure them for IoT and for smart contracts uh, applications, uh, who could use this data and how it could be used. And uh, I know, for example, from Rob Van Klinenburg, he contributed a lot uh, in these um, identity, and identity and identification questions. And here we can understand what kind of the identifications, who will be the source of these identifications if the person and has a right to control her own data, if he can ask the corporations or state uh, to delay them, how it could be stored and how it could be managed. Uh, from the, let's say, public point of view, I would like to say what's most important here is how we can bring uh, all this information in an understandable story uh, for people, for the common people, because most of the, let's say, video productions, articles and uh, pictures, they usually highlight for us some dramatic uh, picture, like the cyber physical systems or cyber phys physical world. And there's, for example, robotics, they could, um, let's say, control human and they could be out of control. And this is very important if you could build the nice story about the ethical applications in financial models in this uh, cyber-physical world which connected between the people, between the machines and machines, and how it could be organized. And it's not easy when we go to the practical dimension because we understand what uh, we have at least uh, four or five huge corporations or state-backed corporations who has a different nature in terms of the values, we can say about Russia, about China, about Europe, about the United States companies, 
they built on the different backgrounds. They finance it from the different streams. Most likely it could be from the state, it could be the defense department, or it could be corporate approach. And all these things, they definitely influence the models and how these models could be structured. If you, from the beginning, would like to control or manipulate or direct to manipulate, or you should build your algorithms, your financial algorithms, definitely around these, let's say, values and uh, ethical things which belong to the people. We understand, for example, what China has his own WeChat ecosystem or Ali ecosystem. And in the United States, we have corporate ecosystems, more or less the same in Russia. And in China, we know what these systems more or less belong to the states. But when we are going to the corporations, it's quite hard to find the backgrounds, who control data and who invent the algorithms and how we will use that, especially after this new phenomena about the deplatforming, which we observed last year. It's definitely the new trend. And we are talking about the Internet of Things. It's exactly the important point for us. For example, what we will do if someone decides to switch off our safety system, our food chain system, whatever, our transport safety systems. And it's not clear how we can organize all these uh, things together and to achieve with some practical results. Uh, from the uh, um, approach, I would like to say what this good story about the IOT financial models could belongs to the some kind of um, joint work from the different uh, perspectives in, in terms of the development of the kind of philosophy. Specifically, I would say very important to align the work going on in Russia with the work going on in Europe at the moment, especially around these digital around this dig, these digital currencies. And the way I understand it is that you a sort of a sort of um, um, yeah you have this kind of economic thinking this in which you try to to um, to embed a kind of value system before this new digital currency actually becomes becomes live and and, and takes over this new kind of uh, this new kind of um, connected environment this is very important and this is, I think, uh, something that's lacking today in uh, in in the way that uh, Europe is uh, thinking about it, which is much more much more in terms of um, economic efficiency. Am I correct in sort of understanding this? Or yes, you are fully correct because definitely when we are going a little bit up from the financial models, we are, should understand the economic models or political economic models, and we understand what in the world we have more or less kind of the capitalism or neo capitalism and a lot of the thinkers, I mean, from even from the Western world, they already told what this system is not working at all or not working for all people. And when we are going to what kind of system we would like to craft, we should understand the backbone of this system. And definitely we should understand the values of this backbone. Uh, should this system have some kind of let's say basic income for all or this is not acceptable for example and these financial models also could be part of that if uh, we can introduce on the layer of smart contracts some kind of a basic income or whatever the social dimension like say social um, prescriptions when from each year of transactions uh, you can send some kind of money for your pension funds or to your relatives or whatever to some people who would like to uh, to contribute in some community development. And in terms of uh, the status of Internet of Things in Russia, I would like to say what we are in a very good position. We have the several uh, state level programs uh, dedicated to the development of the digital economy. And uh, as a sub track, definitely we have IoT track, and most of our corporations, telecommunications and inform information corporations, they have his own um, approach 
for IoT and this, let's say, term very understandable by common people and by our decision makers. And I would like to say that we are Russia on the right track here. And also we cooperate, uh, for example, with European partners, with China. We work a lot on different uh, digital applications. And um, if some particular questions, I can comment more. But from a general point of view, if you compare the situation like uh, 10 years ago, when we start out with our Russian research center or something like that, no one understand what is the meaning of Internet of Things. It was not understandable. But today is an um, understandable term. And we have different associations dedicated to that and different initiatives, how to develop, how to build the products around that. And of course, we have uh, our own IoT platforms and uh, quite good one. Thank you. So if you Google the IoT on the internet, you, you see a number of phrases or words on the screen on the internet. You see something like Internet of Things, um, Embedded Internet, Internet of Everything, Industrial Internet, and a lot. So basically, when we talk about IoT, we're talking about combination of a hardware and a software technology that are going to produce trillions of data through connected multiple devices and sensors. Then the previous speakers um, mentioned and presented a number of solutions and applications they built um, during their, uh, their, their, their sessions. And these data are going to be, I'm going to make sense out of this data using intelligent tools such as the machine learning, the AI algorithms, and then the rest. So we're looking at anything, living and non-living things, regardless of their locations or physical restrictions connected to the internet. So the next phase of my presentation is going to be on the IT community we're building in Africa. So our community, we started back in 2016. And as of today, we have about 7,000 membership um, across 10 African countries in Africa. Um, a quote from Alan Ken, he said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So according to research, um, Africa is going to be the next continent with the largest population of youth in the next 10 years by 2030. And majority of our youth are going to be youth under 25 years um, in the next 10 years. So we, we see that it's, it's, it's a need for us to build the capacity of the youth to empower them with the, the emerging technology so that we're able to solve Africans' problem. So as a community, we are a community of innovators, inventors, developers, makers, and our core purpose is coming together to explore these emerging technologies of the 21st century um, to solve Africa's problem. So our thought of exploration has been in the Internet of Things, robotics, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, among others. So our vision is to become a hub of emerging technologies in Africa and a mission to build digital communities empowered emerging technologies to solve an African's problem. Our core goals has been to build a vibrant tech ecosystem across the African continents. And we also seek to democratize digital skills of the 21st century. We also want to foster creative thinking, problem solving, and innovation. So our, our core values has been learning, sharing, and building. Over the past five years of operation, we've been having consistent monthly meetup uh, since 2016 till now. And through that, we've been able to also build a larger audience, reach out to a number of people, add a number of presence on the African continent, and we also engage in events, workshops, and hackathons. We also undertake a number of projects and also doing more research and development with focus on SDG. So our next phase is be able to build more solutions and then build them into startups. Um, in the next five years, we're hoping to have our chapters across all the African countries. And then we also started state chapters. So within each country, we're creating sub subgroups within the country for the states or regions. We've also taken our activities to the university campuses because we believe that the future of work and skills has changed and there's a need to make sure all the tertiary students are being aware, especially in our part of the world, our education system highly changed. So we bring the community to uh, the universities so that the student can also get to see where the future of work will be and prepare themselves to already. 
our projects. Um, so far, we have uh, a number of chapters um, having the IT community running. Um, from starting from Ghana, we have Nigeria, Kenya, and the rest on board. And some of the initiatives we've undertook over the past five years has been to get more women or girls or ladies in STEM. Uh, when we started, a lot of ladies were not attending our meetups over the past years. So with this initiative, we're able to get a great number of women to also um, join the STEM revolution. We've also started a robotics space where we run robotics training, build robotics, and then explore the technologies behind robotics. We've started activities for kids to engage kids in STEM education as well. We believe this engagement helped them build the critical thinking skills, the problem solving skills, collaboration and teamwork at a very young age whilst they are having fun. Uh, we have the GS space. Hack Corona V is an initiative we started last year when COVID hit Ghana in March. And our, our objective was to research and find solutions to fight COVID-19. And a number of solutions that we came up with are all featured in a slide I will share. When it comes to, okay, then let me, we have a 3D printing groups focused on building 3D printers and then exploring that technology. We have the IIT space. IIT Valley 2 is a recent initiative we are starting because we've, we've realized that in a part of the world, dedication and awareness as far as emerging technology are concerned is very, very low. So we starting a show or a podcast to bring um, these technologies to the average person in Africa. Then we have the IIT campus where we engage the campuses with the future of skills and work. Then we're also looking into space exploration and edge computing with NVIDIA. So among our STEM projects, uh, according to Albert Einstein, he said, we cannot solve a problem using the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. So what it passes is um, we have a series of problems in Africa that we believe that in order for us to be able to solve most of this problem with these emerging technologies, would have to change our way of thinking. So these are some pictures from our activities from our tertiary engagements, where we take them through IoT cycle building with open source hardware. Um, well, this, we also take our activities to secondary cycle institutions where we engage students in robotics and electronics and IoT. Uh, we also engage the junior secondary schools to in the STEM or STEM, where we have them exposed to VR solutions, robotics, 3D printing, and Arduino kids. We also engage kids in robotics. So one of our workshops with these kids, we're able to use local materials, wood, and then e-waste and a couple of electronics devices to build these robots, which was locally built. So we have the Arduino Nano, ultrasonic sensor, motors, motor driver, and batteries. And the kids were able to build this. And each, each kid were able to build one for themselves. So these are our team for our training programs. So when it comes to um, development to as such our training or capacity building, we we'll also explore how we can build circuits or IoT devices with the little resources we have. And these are some of the projects we've built over the past years. So we have the smart thermostat, the smart bin to monitor the bin and then send the data to the cloud. And we have a smart switch where we can control this, our switches with our phone from wherever we are and collect data about energy consumption and, and current. So these are some of the finished prototypes we built over the years. And these are our project team. So when COVID came to, we explored the same technologies to build a number of solutions to help out the COVID. This is a 3D printed face mask, which is reusable, recyclable, and low cost. We also came with a face shield to help with the front liners. We also came with a mask strap. Um, the ear, sorry, the nose mask was etching the ears when you put long for so uh, so long. So we came with this that help you hang it. It's 3D printed. We also had um, smart buckets. So with a bucket we have in Ghana here in Africa, it was mostly a normal bucket with a tap face. So you usually have to open the tap, wash your hand, and when you finish washing your hand, you need to touch it. And these buckets were exposed to the public, everybody was using it. So we saw that um, the rice soup also uh, stay on surfaces for a while. So there's a need to avoid touch, touching surfaces. So we came up with this automated. We also came with a disinfected boots where the body is being sprayed whilst you walk into it. A sensor sensor 
and then spray on you for some minutes before you leave. Then we also built um, handheld thermometer guns. It's already printed the casing and also how we fight in it. So on this solution we're looking at is smart city. Um, Ghana happens to be one of the, the countries with the highest e-waste and air pollution. So we're looking at how best we can collect the data about environment and help uh, policymakers to make informed decisions. According to um, the former UN <laughs> secretary, he said, in a society that does not succeed in tapping into the energy and creativity of which it will be left behind. So as a community and as a president of the community, uh, our focus has been how we can prepare the youth for the fourth industrial revolution. Um, Africa has been catching up for the past revolution, but we're hoping that uh, with this fourth industrial revolution, be able to also join the race and prepare Africa for the future. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Tejmade Afonja and I'm the co-founder of AI Sasta Lagos. I'm currently a master's student at Zaland University, also a machine learning researcher. It's a pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about some of my work and also about machine learning, about machine learning and deep learning. Um, the way I like to think of machine learning is just a bunch of algorithms that are here to help us make sense of data. As you all know, we have increasingly in a society where more, more and more data are being thrown at us and we need to be able to find some hidden correlation, something that we might not be able to do as programmers. In the past, the way you would think about solving such problem would be to program it by hand, like write a bunch of rows, but machine learning enable or allow you to be able to program without explicitly pro programming. So you just make sure you have lots of data, you pass the data into some function, and then you have your hotspot. So the job of your your model is to learn the hidden correlation with the input and the output and voila, you have your favorite fish, fish recognition, favorite fish, fish recognition model which is probably another story for another day. So another example you can think of is like say machine translation. So is it possible to have a language, uh, some, some sentences in one language and you want to translate it to another language? Let's say um, I have audiences that are currently on this live stream that they don't speak English or they don't understand English. Is it possible to have real time translation of what I'm saying to a language that they're familiar with? Which brings me to another project, a project that I am working on, which is on, on accent translation. So the question really is that, uh, is it possible for us to model accent or to be able to translate from one person's accent to another? Let me motivate the question, the problem properly. So um, it's not a news that different region in different part of the world have different various accents in which they are speaking. For some of my Nigerian friends here, yeah, they probably already know that I'm Nigerian because I, I speak like a Nigerian. Whatever it is that it means to them might be different, but the, the main point is that everyone has their own unique voice and the way they speak. And sometimes the unique voice is particular to a particular region, a particular nation. So. So uh, we had, we found correlation, like, and some of this is also my own lived ex experience is that it takes more time to understand content if it's presented in an accent that you're not familiar with. So the question, the research question really is that, is it possible to be able to, to translate a problem or like um, we, we go a little bit down to say, a, an online learning platform, is it possible to present this to you in an accent that you are familiar with? And you can think about all of this, um, such problem, and think about how it would help improve a lot of a lot of people's a lot of people's understanding. And and one of one of the motivation really is that you, you think about inequality. 
it on equal access so, yes there are a lot of resources out there right now that you can say that you have a massive open online uh, um, on online courses you have youtube channels but the the ugly truth still is that there's still a lot of barrier to be able to access this like so it's still there's still a gap to fill and i don't think like having just one model or one accent or one language or whatnot is going to be the solution to all of our problem we need to be able to adapt technology to the local users whatever works best for them we need to start building tools for that even if there is no incentive to be able to do that so um my my team we that we're trying to the problem we're focused on is that can we can we do accent translation can we improve online learning by translating um, an English content to an accent that you're familiar with. Whether or not it's possible, that's research. That's a question we are asking. My name is Aisha Togwadabe, and I will be presenting to you um, some of the lessons learned and the learnings from the IoT SLAM 2021 conference on women's planning. And I was part of the career pivot um, panel. And in particular, I was also uh, sharing my experience of becoming an AI technologist. And as you can see in this image, there were a lot of women who participated in this event. And it was hosted uh, by Suda Jamte, technology futurist, and Roxy Simpson. And um, there were about 28 female business leaders celebrating their accomplishments. And uh, we were spotlighting uh, the career pivots they have made to get them where they are today. And um, I will be sharing with you my career pivot as becoming an AI technologist. And I'm an AI visual artist, I'm a peace technologist, and I'm a conversation designer and public speaker. And um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and I have a website where you can find my art as well. To give you more an idea about um, why I call myself a peace technologist. So peace is kind of my compass. Uh, anything that I do, whether it's work-related or privately when I'm engaging in um, activities, I always try to find ways how I can improve uh, the lives of society, how um, I can increase peaceful societies. And um, here I want to give you a few examples of peace technology um, that I worked on while going through my journey towards an AI technologist. So I was looking into how I can use AI for conflict prediction, how I can use AI for social justice, how I can use it for language preservation and for edutainment. I was part of this AI lab, so I wanted to look into a solution that was tackling uh, one of the sustainable development goals, in particular sustainable development goal 16, which is about peace, justice and strong strong institutions and as i mentioned i was working on this conflict between nomadic cattle herders and farmers so of course the question that i wanted to ask myself was how what if we could predict violent conflicts between nomadic cattle herders and sedentary farmers in sub-saharan Af africa before they arise and help stop them how could we use technology to do that and while i was doing my research um, as a peace um, expert of course Prevention is the key because um, when you look at the numbers, um, there are about 74 million people currently facing acute food insecurity, and um, there are about um, 70.8 million people who will be fleeing their countries by 2030. So there's really an urgency in developing these kind of solutions. And I was looking into natural language processing also known as NLP or computational linguistics, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence, machine learning and linguistics, and a branch of AI, and it helps computers or machines understand, manipulate and interpret human language. So I was looking into that and into how um, I could use leverage um, NLP for the language Hausa, because I'm originally also from Nigeria. So Hausa was kind of the language uh, I thought that would make the most impact as there are over 150 million speakers worldwide. And then while I was working on this, I realized that language barrier is a, a huge problem and um, that uh, we needed really to work on this issue. 
And as you, as you can see, there are all, already 52 languages worldwide uh, in African, on the African continent that already have undergone language death. Therefore, there's really an urgency to, to work on this. And why African NLP? Because um, by increasing the capacity between different countries on the African continent to communicate and to translate, we can also increase dialogue and, and communication and peace in the world and also bridge the language gap. Um, I also participated in the Women in AI um, and Robotics Accelerator. And there I was continuing to work on this idea. And to give you an idea about AI for social justice, I participated in a hackathon where we won the grand, grand prize because we developed an app against AI bias in the criminal justice system. And here I can show you a little bit about how this app looks like. It shows this famous uh, compass algorithm and we decided to develop an, a normalized score to show how the person should have been judged um, fairly instead. So um, this is kind of an app that can help judges decide, make better decisions and not solely rely on the compass algorithm, but also look into other um, examples of why maybe a person might have been judged uh, in a different way and why that person might have uh, received a specific score. And um, maybe another example I want to share before the end of the t uh, this my slot. Um, one of the latest things I've been working on is conversational AI, and I developed a serious game voice skill called Fuller. And it's an immersive educational series game about the Fulani people, um, which is going to be published on the, for the Alexa. And uh, here I was trying to explore how you can use a conversational AI uh, to, to develop an educational content and at the same time preserve the culture and knowledge of this Fulani, of the Fulani tribe of West Africa. Hello everybody, I'm Sudha Jamte. I'm super excited to join you here and I'm joining here from uh, California. So it's morning for you, but happy evening. Good evening, Europe. Hope you're having a fantastic session. It's just amazing to see the lineup and some of them are people I follow and uh, have conversations in the IoT Council. So I'm super excited to go back and uh, listen to the podcast and all the ones I missed to talk to so, you about IoT Day Women's Planning, which is an event that we organized. And I organized along with this person, Roxy Stimson, right here. Uh, she's a data, IoT data uh, leader from uh, F5. And uh, I am so thankful to this amazing set of women from around the globe who came, found time to women's plain a topic and help us understand about IoT and data from IoT and AI from IoT and how the career pivoted to do the wonderful things that they were doing. And as you can see, uh, there are about 28 women in here, including us. And the way we set it up was, we said every uh, nine o'clock in every time zone, we want one IoT expert to go give a session. So the way we did that was, uh, I'm here in California, so my evening the previous day was nine o'clock in Singapore, and that's when we kicked it off. So we had a series of sessions that was set up to stream and it kept going live um, all through our night and into morning in Europe and Nigeria. And then uh, morning, uh, my time here, uh, uh, Roxy and I picked it up and we said, okay, from nine o'clock our time till four o'clock, we will do live sessions with multiple panels. And we started with the career pivot session. We had a whole bunch of uh, keynotes and discussions. You must have already heard Aisha Tupurabe. She's a peace technologist. Uh, you must have heard from Tejumade of Funja. Uh, she's a deep learning scientist. We had a panel with her and uh, two of her colleagues uh, um, here, uh, Aditola and uh, Oriva Gane from uh, uh, Nigeria joined her ball. Both of them are uh, uh, deep learning uh, uh, engineers, data scientists. 
So it was such a fun discussion. And uh, I want to, what I'm going to talk about today is about no code AI for you. And I, so no code AI is essentially how a business user can build artificial intelligence using code without actually coding, right? So the first step is because AI is trained using data, you get training data and then the AI doesn't know what is data, what data is good data, bad data, how does it make decisions? So we have to group the training data into what are called classes, and then we build the model. It's simple. So the next three minutes, I'm going to focus on data because that is what is the brains of the AI. That is what powers the AI. So when you're building no code AI, what you're essentially doing is you're focused on this data, getting the training data. So training data can be images, sounds, numbers, anything. So if you want to teach the AI to identify a dog, you get a bunch of dog pictures and you get a variety of pictures. So here this dog has a background. It is in the field here. The, it, there is no background here. There's another object next to it. This is a very interesting looking dog and it doesn't have to be one dog. Here's a bunch of puppies and they're in a box and there's a background too. So you get the idea. So that's how you end up showing a lot more, right? So let me turn it to full screen. What if we want to teach the AI to identify a mop? Yeah, mop, right? So here again, I've collected a variety of different mops. And look at that. This is, looks like a dog, but it's really a mop. So this is kind of to trick the AI. So when you train the AI, you're trying to get variety of data so that it understands all kinds of context by which it will understand the, the object. So the second thing is to organize this. So we saw two set of images. One is dogs, one is mops. So you just say, here's class one dogs, here's class two mops. And then you build a model. So to build a model, I'm going to go and do one, a model that is called dog versus mop. And now you can see here's two dogs and they could go as dogs or mop. And we as humans can actually find that out. So I'm going to use a tool called Teachable Machine. It's a no code AI platform and I have set it up here. So I literally have not done too much prep here. So you can actually catch me doing this live. So I went to teachablemachine.withgoogle.com. And, and they gave me three options. So I, I clicked on start and they ended up with three options. So I'm going to do an image project, pros one. And I'm going to say one class is dogs. And I'm doing this live, it fails, it fails, but it's going to work. You're going to do this with me, okay? So essentially I've created three or two of these classes. I don't want a third class, I just clicked by mistake. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload some dog images, okay? So let's see. Do I have dog images? Here I have dog one to five. And I just got these dog pictures from the internet. Here we go. Now I'm going to mops and I showed you pictures, right? What I showed in the in the deck. So I'm gonna go find the mop. And it's finding me bunch of mops so i'm taking mop one and and there is no uh, limit on how many uh, data that you can actually use but what i'm going to do is i'm going to show a lot of different mop pictures done so here i put this picture which look like a dog but it's not a mop okay so just to make sure that we have enough and then the next step is you train the model here we go. I start training, 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 and it's training. And it's almost done. It says, don't switch the tab. Okay, I won't. And it says the model is done. And here we go. And I am going to turn it to a file and say here, I want to upload. So what are we doing here? So let me take a step back. So we got a group of images and said, here's, these are dogs. We got a group of images and we said, these are mops. We grouped them. So that's our training data. We clicked, train the model and it trained the model. And the next step is all AI is going to say, yes, I'm done and I have a model. So it is left to us to figure out whether it is right, how efficient it is, how well it is performing. So this is the stage, stage where I'm doing, where I'm validating the model. 
So I'm going to choose an image and say, hey, do you know? So I just have another picture here. You can see this one. I've kept, I've called that a test one. And I'm going to put that here. And as a human, would you call this a dog or a mop? And the AI says it is 75% confident it's a dog. 25% it thinks it's a mop. So if you look at this, this could go for a mop because it seems to have some kind of handle. But then, hey, it seems to have a tongue. So as a human, I would say it's a dog. So if you notice this number, it is not 100% confident because the kind of dogs it has seen are only these. And all of them, somehow it has figured out that sticking its tongue is a factor in determining that it's a dog. So what we can do to improve the performances of this model is to actually give it more training data. So we can give it some more training data and retrain the model again. And that is what uh, we heard uh, Christine talk about, that it is able to continuously learn. So now it is ready and we can send it out. What if this is a self-driving car and it is not confident on what object it sees on the road? I wouldn't want it to go out with 75% confident. What it is a robotic surgical arm? I want it. I do not want it to go do any kind of surgery on me if it is coming with 75% degree of confidence and 25%, I don't know if I need to move. And so I would say I would like to get to 100%, but AI is never at 100%. So, so if you're interested to move to the field of AI after listening to everybody and you're fascinated by all the IoT that is actually creating those jobs, I would say look at this. This is businessschoolofai.com slash jobs. And the fascinating thing, and you can connect with me as a follow-up if you're interested. You can tweet at me at Sujamte, and I'm happy to you know, follow up with you if you're interested and get any guidance.